Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So I don't know why the speakers are giving the feedback. I think it has to do with this microphone, but I'm not entirely sure because I believe that microphone's turned off. So we'll do the best we can. Hope we find it. I think we found it. All right. When Ethan and Grace were younger, I loved to read to them. And Dr. Seuss books were the favorites. Green Eggs and Ham, The Lorax, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Right? All the parents are smiling. They remember these books as well. Right? They were silly, they're fun, and colorful. One of my favorites of Dr. Seuss was called The Sneetches. Yeah? And this story begins with these words. Now, the star-bellied Sneetches had bellies with stars. The plain belly Sneetches had none upon bars. Those stars weren't so big, they were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But because they had stars, all the star belly Sneetches would brag, we're the best kind of Sneetches on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We'll have nothing to do with those plain belly sort. And whenever they met some, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past without even talking. Then along comes one of my favorite Dr. Seuss characters in all of the books that he does. And it's really my favorite for his name alone, but his actions are quite amazing too. He is called Sylvester McMonkey McBean. Huh? Only Dr. Seuss could come up with such a great name, right? Sylvester McMonkey McBean, who had a machine that would add stars to the bellies of the Sneetches. And you could see where this was headed, can't you? Right? For three dollars each, Sylvester McMonkey McBean Add stars to all the plain belly sneetches until everyone is the same. And the star belly sneetches are angry until Sylvester McMonkey McBean introduces another machine. For ten dollars each, he'll remove all the stars from the star belly sneetches. Yeah. And we enter into a loop that seems like it will be endless as all the Sneetches spend their money, $3 here, $10 there, to add the snar stars and then have them removed. And this goes on and on and on. And we see Sylvester McMonkey McBean say in the background, will they never learn? Until they run out of money. They run out of what can earn them acceptance. And having spent all their money, one group desperately trying to keep a two-tiered system intact, and the other group desperately trying to change to fit in. It's a silly, colorful, and fun story. And yet it's so profound. For three weeks now, we've been studying together Acts 15, Galatians 1 and 2, and Galatians 3, and we've wrestled together in each of these texts with the same dynamic. As the church brings the gospel out into the world, they're left with this question, who belongs? Who belongs? For what seems hardwired into the fabric of human nature is this dynamic that we sometimes call tribalism. It's this thought pattern or mentality of us 
versus them. And that thought pattern establishes this basic idea in almost every culture that we encounter. We have insiders and outsiders. We have good guys and we have bad guys. We have winners and losers. If you like biblical references, we have those under the law and those outside of the law. We're all either star-bellied or plain-bellied. All of our stories, think about all of the stories you've ever heard or read, they ooze with this dynamic of tribalism. It's not only what we see when we look out into the world, it's so powerful Tribalism becomes the very lenses that we use to see and look out at the world. And that's why our text for this morning is so outrageous and so radical. I can't keep doing this. You know. I don't like to look through the lens of tribalism. So we'll set that aside for a minute. You start with where it ends. Start with where the text ends. It says, there is no longer Jew or Greek, one of the ways we divide ourselves up. There is no longer slave or free, another way we divide ourselves up. There is no longer male and female, another way we divide ourselves up. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, does that mean that there are literally no more Jews or Greeks or rich or poor or male and female? No, of course not. That's not what that text means. What it's saying, if I were to summarize it with, with a simple statement, I could say it this way. God shows no partiality. In fact, you can read James and you'll find those very words written. God shows no partiality partiality. And we like that, I think, because it tells us that we have a chance before God. We like the idea that God shows no partiality. It feels good. And then we could start saying things that come out of the implications of that. So we could say, God loves the rich no less and no more than God loves the poor because God shows no partiality. Now we might be rich or we might be poor, so we kind of like that one, right? But I can push it further, push it a little further. God loves the Syrian, the Afghan, the Palestinian, and the Jew, no less and no more than God loves the American. God shows no partiality. Is that tribal feeling start to bubble up in your stomach a little bit? <laughs> like, wait, wait, aren't, aren't we a chosen people? Starting to twitch just a little bit yet? We dealt with economy, we dealt with nationality. I can push you further. I can make that twitch start to really start going in your stomach. God loves the gay man, the lesbian, the bisexual, no less and no more than God loves the straight person. God shows no partiality? I told you, human nature oozes with tribalism. It oozes within our very fiber this idea that there is an us and a them. 
In fact, it's so strong, we often shape the gospel into a tribal story. We imagine the gospel through the lenses of tribalism and us versus them battle. It's part of what Christians would call our sinful nature. But again, let me just quote Scripture to you. God shows no partiality. So how do we make sense of this? How do we understand this in light of what we know what Scripture says and what Paul says in this text? Well, let's start at the beginning and work our way down to the last thing that Paul has to say. Because as we do this, I think what you'll recognize is there's this deep, outrageous truth that Paul is getting at, and it will make all the difference in the world for how we live. So Paul says that God enters into history in a special way by calling a man named Abram and forming from him a people, a tribe, He says, I will make you a great nation. And I can hear that inner gut inside you saying, see, I can see tribalism in Scripture. It's good, Pastor, so get off my back. Right? But if you actually read the call of God, I think what you'll find is something interesting because the kernel of the Gospel is rooted and buried right in the call of Abram. Genesis 12, God says, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And you can read all sorts of tribalism in that, right? Us, them. But don't stop there because the the Word of God continues and that's where Paul picks it up. Because the verse ends, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right? Because God has in mind that He's going to bless everyone. Right? So here's what we see. God enters the system of human frailty and sinfulness. He enters into the system of tribalism so that God might transform it from the inside out. Now who does that sound like? Who enters the system of sin so that he might transform it from the inside out? If you're not too distracted, I think you'll have a certain man in mind. Paul notes that Abraham's righteousness is rooted in faith. He trusts God, puts his life in God's hands, submits and surrenders to God, and he is transformed through that surrender. So God says, leave everything you know. Leave your country, leave your homeland, leave your family, leave everything and go to the place that I will show you. And Abraham surrenders and submits and God recognizes it as righteousness. In this trust of Abraham, God makes him new. And that begins the foundational reality of faith that Paul says is what we're supposed to be all about from the beginning. It's all about faith. So why do we even have the law then? Why have the law at all if it's all about faith? Well, that's a great question, and Paul pushes further into it. Because if you follow the story of Abraham along, what you find is that Abraham and his children clung to the I will make you a great nation part and often set aside the in you all the families of the earth will be blessed part. They loved the thing that made them special. They didn't like so much the idea that that specialness was to bless everyone. So you see what happens, right? God enters the system to offer a, a renewed way of looking at life 
to upend their tribalism, and with their tribalism, they make it comfortable for themselves. They take God's very call and they turn it tribal. So God then introduces the law. And the law has a specific job, Paul tells us. The job is to be a guardian or a disciplinarian. And the Greek word there is really helpful because what's it de what it's describing is a specific servant of the master whose job it was to walk the children to school and protect them and guard them as they made their way for their learning. Now, I know what this looks like. Because as a parent, I used to do this all the time with my kids. It was my job to walk them to school, or in our parlance, to drive them to school, to keep them safe, and to protect them, to be their guardian as they made their way to, to, to school. But what happens when they get older? Do they need me anymore? No. After a certain point, they're capable of walking to school on their own. They don't need my protection any longer. And that's the case with the, with the law as well. Paul says that when we are clothed in Christ, when we have grown to full maturity, when we have become the children of God we're called to be, then we no longer need the law as disciplinarian or protection. For in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. And the children of God there is adult children. Adult children, grown children, who have matured in faith so that they no longer need the disciplinarian of the law. They no longer need the guardian to protect them for they're in Christ in faith. So what then does the, the law teach us? What's, what's the tutelage? What's the point of it? What's its guardianship doing? Well, Richard Rohr writes this. He says, it's not to make God love you. Think about that for a minute. The law is not there to make God love you. God already loves you. And you cannot make God love you any more or any less by any technique whatsoever. The purpose of spiritual law is to sharpen your awareness about your own weaknesses and about who God is for you in that situation. So let me, let me unwrap that a little bit because Roar's next words are really important. When you recognize your own radical inability to obey the law, and in that same moment ask for God's mercy, you have achieved its deepest purpose. So what is the law's deepest purpose? Is it to prove you're holy? Is it to make God love you more? Is it to prove that you're better than your neighbor? No. We all fall short in keeping the law. So its deepest purpose is this. Surrender is the goal, not personal success. Surrender is the goal. Let me put it in words you might like better. Trust is the goal. Faith is the goal. Relying upon God is the goal. Not my own works righteousness. That's the purpose of the law. And you see that reality in Abraham. For Abraham is counted righteous not by keeping the law, not by his personal success, not by all the techniques that he uses to get God to love him more. No, he's made righteous by believing, trusting, surrendering to God's will. 
And in that, he's made right. The law shows us that we're all in the same place. All distinctions of worthiness or righteousness or partiality are removed by the guardianship of the law. The ways we divide and distinguish are removed. Maybe you don't trust me. I'll give you Paul. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's the purpose of the law to draw us into surrender. And when you get to that place of surrender, you discover that God can use even your failures, even your failings to redeem you. That God enters into the broken system to unravel it. Enters into the tribalism to pull it apart and give us a whole new way of living. A whole new system. A whole new set of lenses to look out into the world. And we call these lenses grace. Grace is a new way of seeing that there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. Grace is what the law is leading us to. So, again, can't take me seriously in those, so I'm going to take them off a minute. Did the law work perfectly? Did that way of God work perfectly, drawing us all into a surrender, leveling the playing field and calling God's people back to being the blessing they're called to be for the whole world? No, of course not. We do what we always do, right? We wrapped our tribal arms around the law and we pretended that some of us could keep it. That some of us could keep it perfectly and then be holy while the bad ones, outsiders, those who don't belong, can't keep it and they remain outside. We took this guardian of God meant to draw us back into grace and trust and we shaped a whole new way of being tribal around it. God has entered the system in the law to transform our tribalism from the inside out and we keep twisting it from the call of Abraham to the law so what does God do? Does God give up? Does God give in? No. God goes further up and further in. And God enters into our system fully in the man Jesus Christ. And in Christ, God calls to us even stronger. Surrender. Trust. Be transformed by the grace I've always had for you. Be renewed by my purpose that's always been there for you. Grace. Grace. It's just another way of saying God shows no partiality. Grace. It's just another way of saying there's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, for all of you are one in Christ. Grace. Now what difference does that make 
in the world? How does it change us? Well, John Calvin writes this. He says, we ought to embrace the whole human race without exception in a single feeling of love. Just in case you think I'm some radical liberal from the modern times, that's Calvin. <laughs> right? Calvin, by the way, some who claim is as tribal as anyone. Right? He says here there is no distinction between barbarian and Greek worthy and unworthy, friend and enemy, since all should be contemplated in God, not in themselves. Let me translate that for you in modern terms. We can think of them all through the lens of tribalism. They're different than me. They look different than me. They act different than me. So they're not going to receive my love. They're out. We contemplate them in themselves. Or, surrendering to God, putting our trust in God, putting our faith in Christ, we can put on the lens of grace. We can put on the vision of God and contemplate them in God as God sees them. And there is no barbarian and no Greek, no worthy and unworthy, no friend and enemy, for we reach out to all without exception with the love of Christ. In grace, we perceive reality in a whole new way. And we let go of the systems that seek to divide us, isolate us, and ultimately condone violence among us. You see the end of tribalism, don't you? Paul talks about that. He says, for the wages of sin are death. You need some modern examples of that? In Egypt this week, 29 Christians were making a trek to a place of prayer and they were done, gunned down and killed. Men, women, and children. Why? because they weren't a part of the tribe. In Portland this week, a white man was berating two Muslim women, telling them to get out and to leave and to get, be gone. And three men stood up to confront him and he stabbed all three of them, killing two. Why? Because they didn't fit in the tribe. For the wages of sin are death. And you see the end of tribalism, don't you? It's death. But you see the end of tribalism, don't you? You are all one in Christ Jesus. You are called to trust, to surrender, called to grace, entering the system to upend it and transform it. You are all called to enter into the world, but not be conformed by it, but to transform it through grace. We'll end where we started. Do you remember Sylvester McMonkey McBean? 
my favorite character, I think he stands in for God in that story. He stands in for God in that story and he enters in with the sneetches and he says, will they never learn? And he watches them spend everything they've got to transform and to fit in and to, to isolate and to keep out until they can't do any more work. They have nothing left. And then Sylvester McMonkey McBean walks away. And they all look around and they say, I don't remember which tribe I was a part of. I can't remember which of us are star-bellied and which of us are plain-bellied. And having spent themselves fully of all they could to differentiate themselves, they recognize, oh wait, we're all the same. We're one in Christ.